On this week's episode of Friends, Rachel and Phoebe find out about a secret affair between Monica and Chandler. Not wanting things to be awkward between them, Rachel casually pulls Monica aside and has a talk with her, letting Monica know what she saw. They come to a natural understanding, and the episode ends in five minutes. Ha! <laughs> Just kidding. We're going to make this four episodes. How? By a convoluted process of doing everything except talking to each other like grown adults. In the world of storytelling, simple answers are usually the right ones. When a character does something silly or unrealistic, more often than not, you're you doing it as a plot device. Let's keep it moving. I'm author DC Ferguson, and this is the World Building Dojo. I've said it before and I'll say it again, always remember KISS. Keep it simple, stupid. Our stories can exponentially go off the rails the more complex and convoluted our plots get. If we don't want to get bogged down, a clear and concise trajectory through the story should be required. Why is Luke on the hero's journey? Well, to become a Jedi like his father. What is Neo's motivation for seeking out Morpheus? Because the world he lives in doesn't feel right. What is Indiana Jones doing going after all these trapped artifacts? When he's desperate for knowledge and the thrill of solving historical mysteries. These are simple motivations that usually can boil down to one sentence. Motivation is often the key factor that gets messed up and leads to convolution in your plots. The funny thing is, you can have extremely complex and intricate plots that still boil down to a simple motivation. For example, why is our hero going to space in Interstellar to find a safe world for his daughter to grow up on? You see, even as hard sci-fi and complicated as that film was, there are some clear motivations that propel the story forward. Spotting when you're making a mistake for the purposes of advancing a plot often comes at the cost of believability, which in turn kills suspension of disbelief, which makes audiences grab pitchforks and torches. So let's talk about the biggest mistakes that we can make as storytellers in our conflicts. One thing that's important to note here is that when we're talking about fake problems, it's going to feel a lot like tropes, but only because you've seen these mistakes so many times, not because they're actually tropes. Tropes or cliches are often just that because they're tried and true. They work. You could make a cliche-ridden plot from start to finish, using every trope you can find as a checklist, and still come out with a, an original, working, albeit tired, story that we've seen before. For as tired as it will be, though, it will be simple, and that is what we're trying to do here. So, let's have a chat. As we mentioned in the intro, there are some plots that can be created where the only way to milk the story dry is to have characters doing something complicated that would be resolved in two minutes with a basic conversation. The biggest offender of this cardinal sin of fake problems usually is blended with the genre of comedy. So we see this happen all the time in sitcoms, romantic comedies, comedy dramas, and well, you get the picture. Somewhere along the line, the concept of comedy of errors got warped and twisted into comedy that only works if the characters make dumb, unrealistic decisions and don't have anyone educate them on the mistakes in their beliefs. But I guess that one's too much of a mouthful for anyone to say what it really is. Take for example what I ripped on in the intro there. Monica secretly dates Chandler, though the reason that they're keeping it a secret becomes more confusing the longer they do it. But Joey here knows and they swear him to secrecy, which puts him in an awkward position as their friend, and really is the kind of messed up and selfish thing to ask. But he does it and we move on. Then, Rachel and Phoebe find out, and instead of confronting them like adults, they play this bizarre game of dumb cat and dead mouse to get them to admit to something they already witnessed. Now, I won't lie, it's a funny few episodes, it really is, but even the tiniest amount of thought with a critical eye, and you realize this is some of the dumbest, laziest, most unrealistic writing in the entire series. Now, how do we avoid this pitfall that plagues us like so many Adam Sandler movies? It's actually pretty easy. Forget everything comedy has ever taught you in the past 20 years. No, I'm not kidding. The only reason this pitfall even exists is because it's laden with cliches that only exist in the genre that would cause these movies to fall apart in five minutes with a simple conversation. For example, in your typical romantic comedy, Mr. Guy is in love with Miss Girl, but Mr. Guy is making our girl doubt their relationship. Now, in order to get them broken up at the drop in our three-act structure, 
we have a random girl from work suddenly decide tonight is the night she decides to seduce this attached guy at a party while he's waiting for his girlfriend to arrive. At that very moment, the exact second that their lips touch, Miss Girl walks in, sees them, and is horrified. Instead of any conversation, discussion, yelling, cursing, any anything that would happen in real life, Miss Girl storms out with her broken heart while Mr. Guy says, wait, please, no, but she ignores him because she knows what she saw. It sounds really familiar, doesn't it? It's literally a device used in so many romantic comedies, I'll just say it was the drop in um, Bruce Almighty. These kind of setups are lazy because they're simple. On a base level, everyone can understand, if I caught my partner messing around on me, we're done. So taking a character that would never do something like that and put them into this accidental makeout session with an overly aggressive third party makes for a clean break, especially if Mr. Guy is never allowed a chance to talk, explain, apologize, or basically have any chance what to speak whatsoever. This is a fake problem. It's fake because Mr. Guy would never have messed around on Miss Girl if not for this she-devil accosting him. Miss Girl is the one that he truly loves, so the only way it stays a problem is if neither character is allowed to talk to the other about the situation. Just cut straight to the breakup, cut off all communication between the characters, and now the hero has to come up with a ridiculous, convoluted plan to get her back. In this regard, it's like a magician sawing a woman in half in a clear plastic box. All the magic is gone because we can see how the trick is done. It's like, oh, the writer needs to get them broken up for the drop. Let's have him look like he's cheating on her and she'll leave and then never let them talk about it or work it out in any way until the finale. If it feels like I'm hammering this point over and over, it's because I am. If a conversation would undo your conflict in your story, you have a fake problem. Get back to the drawing board. Antagonists rarely get the same amount of attention in your stories, and I'd say that's rightly so about 99% of the time. For a quick example of where that isn't the case, I'd suggest you head over to Netflix and watch Daredevil Season 1. Giving equal time to develop a strong antagonist is done very well here, teetering on overshadowing the hero. However, for the rest of us, most of the time, we have to use the scenes we have with our antagonists to maximize their development while still moving the story forward. It's a juggling act, to be certain. We plan out all these cool scenes, the hero's interactions with our bad guy, we're tracing out our story arc for the character and the ultimate payoff of the finale. Unfortunately, we didn't see the forest for the trees, so our villain could have killed our hero 16 times by now, but they didn't. Because... reasons. There are two cardinal sins committed by villains in stories, and they often go hand in hand. Not killing the hero when the chance was given, and needlessly complicated plans. If you recall this video on the hero's world, then you'll recall the scale of heroes we discussed in there. Basically, from street-level everyday heroes to once-in-a-generation world changers, the villain and the hero need to be on equal ground uh, on the same level or things feel off. You don't want the villain to be unreachable and you certainly don't want the hero to be punching down. I mean, the Vulture is a super scary villain for Spider-Man, but Iron Man could take him out in like 10 seconds. That's why Iron Man isn't in the movie. Oh, oh crap, wait. Um, he's uh, too busy and, and it's a test for Peter. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Anyway, when you're working with world changers, such as your James Bond, the villain is going to be on the same level. Phenomenally wealthy, skilled, worldly, with any number of tools at his disposal. So the trajectory of these stories is usually find out about the evil plan, meet the antagonist with said evil plan, get caught by the villain, and then shot in the back of the head, and the villain takes over the world. But DC, 4 never happens because the story would be 45 minutes long. Well, guy who talks to your monitor, I'd ask you, is that the problem or a symptom of a larger one? See, if the length of your story, and including all the cool scenes you want, requires that your antagonist does something incredibly stupid and complicated, maybe the problem is the direction you're taking the story. Here, let's go to an example. Today's deep cut is going to be the third film in the Die Hard franchise, 1995's Die Hard with a Vengeance. Now, fair warning, I love this movie, mistakes and all. I was entertained by it, 
in no small part thanks to the stellar Jeremy Irons as the antagonist and go-to anti-hero Bruce Willis teamed with Samuel L. Jackson. For a brief summary, an evil guy that might be related to the bad guy from the original Die Hard is making terrorist attacks against New York City. Thing is, Simon is playing games with John McClane, forcing him to team up with an innocent bystander that offered to help him. The result is they're chasing down these bombs all over the city in a game of cat and mouse until John realizes that all of these attacks and his involvement are a misdirect. This terrorist is really just moving the police and emergency crews around the city so he has a clear path to pull off the heist of a lifetime. Now, this part of the plot works, and it works really well. Like I said, I really enjoyed this film. However, let's skip ahead to the end game. The evil Simon is on a boat, having succeeded in running off with his treasure. But John and his friend show up to ruin the party. So, Simon handcuffs them to a pole on the ship, which is set to explode. Now keep in mind, our plucky heroes have been jumping through hoops, literally solving riddles this entire movie, and generally being the most resourceful people on the planet. So the bad guy ties them to a pole, leaving them to their doom, and then rides off into the sunset, content that there's no way they'll survive. All this dude Simon needs is a handlebar mustache and some train tracks, you know what I mean? It actually took more effort to handcuff them to the pole together than it would have to blow their brains onto the floor, guaranteeing victory. So, how do we detect for this kind of stupidity? Well, ask yourself one question. When I ask you, what stops your antagonist from defeating your hero? If you use the word hubris even once, you have this kind of villain stupidity in your plot. Hubris is the crutch by which every dumb mistake a villain makes becomes their undoing. It is painfully beaten to death, and often employed by characters that are just too damn smart for that. The lesson here on fake problems is that the hero, in this case, is the fake problem. If the story were constructed better, the hero overcomes adversity and transforms. In cases like Die Hard, the antagonist gives an inch and the hero takes a mile to victory. Don't give yourself antagonists with self-sabotaging scenarios. So, we've talked about the hero's actions as a fake problem. We've talked about the antagonist's actions as a fake problem. Now we're going to talk about the conflict itself as the fake problem. When examining your conflict with a critical eye, we need to keep our head on a swivel for easier solutions to the conflict we create. I won't lie, that's not always easy. But the last thing that you want is a bunch of but didn't they just kind of comments from the audience? You want to look at your conflict like you're studying a Rubik's Cube. You're checking every face of it, turning it around, checking it from other angles. Basically, we're looking to make sure our conflict is airtight. Now, when this goes right, it can be wonderful. And we're going to get to an example of that in a second deep cut because I like to spoil you guys. But first, we need to see it done wrong. Let's take a quick look at X-Men Days of Futures Past. Now, not to be confused with the comic book story of the same name, because that one is a classic and actually well-written. No, we're talking about the 2014 movie. Here, Wolverine is the last hope for mutant kind as an army of sentinels rains down and tries to kill off the last of the resistance. Now, as such, his consciousness is sent back in time to a pivotal moment in history when Mystique will murder the man that designed the Sentinels, thus bringing them into existence. So, here's where we go off the rails. There have been, at this point in their messed up timeline, a film prior to this that set up the X-Men in first class, which included Mystique. Now, Wolverine is sent to the past in the days leading up to Mystique murdering this dude. He chases her the whole film long enough to just tell her the consequences of what she's planning. However, if Wolverine was sent back a week, a month, a few years even, back to first class when Mystique hadn't made up her mind yet and could be reasoned with, it's a five minute conversation to undo the conflict in this film. Instead, we have a false clock, putting our heroes on a deadline to prevent an event without enough time to do it. Literally, this movie could have been ended in five minutes by sending Wolverine back further. Now, as a comparison, we're going to hit up a deep cut again. Who loves you? We're talking about the 2004 film The Butterfly Effect, starring Ashton Kutcher. The reason this succeeds is precisely on the same axis where X-Men fails. 
without spoiling anything if you've never seen this, and I do recommend you do if you're a time travel nerd like me. The simplest, easiest solution to the conflict is the only one our hero doesn't want to do. When he realizes all of his time traveling and altering events of the past is creating ripples that never make anything better, he's left with the one choice that costs him everything. It's a bittersweet, almost tragic story that is extremely aware of its simple resolution for the main conflict. It's just the worst choice possible for the hero. So, I've compared these two films to put a huge spotlight on the problem. If I'm being honest, time travel is tricky business, and it often shoots its own plot lines in the foot. One could argue that it's because power like time travel or magic is so vast that you as a writer are practically opening Pandora's box using it at all. So I'd suggest sharpening your pencil and go back to our video on technology and magic, then stop over and watch the time travel video, which explains to you how as a world builder and a writer you can craft with these awesome powers without derailing your story before it even starts. Creating conflict is how we tell a narrative in the world we've created. The risk we take when doing so is that the conflict is undermined by tools and crutches you've imposed on your story, even as they don't make sense in the long run. As you may have noticed in the intro to every single video ever, Art of the Arcane hosts all of my videos in addition to the YouTubes. However, you know what YouTube doesn't have? our other authors giving totally free writing advice. Come and check out the website and soak up all the knowledge you can shake a stick at. If you haven't already done so, don't forget to join my mailing list and hear about all the latest goings on with the Dragon's Dream Saga. And don't forget, I've got book four coming soon and we're gonna be doing a cover reveal ahead of the release on this channel, the mailing list, it's gonna be great. Don't forget to like and subscribe to hear about new videos, and as always, I'm DC Ferguson, now have fun and get crafting.